Tonight's Wisaka Borcha, the full moon in May. The tradition is it was on a full moon in May that the Buddha was born. Then 35 years later, on the full moon in May, he gained awakening. And then 45 years after that, on the full moon in May, he earned a total nirvana. So we're commemorating three events tonight. It was on that last night, the night of Nirvana Nibbana, when devas were paying homage to the Buddha with flowers, music, incense. And the Buddha told the monks, that's not how you pay homage to the Buddha. The true way to pay homage is to practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. So tonight, let's practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. What that means is two things. One is practicing for the sake of dispassion. That's what the Dharma is all about. There was one time when some monks were going to be leaving to go to a foreign country, and the Buddha told, told them when they came to pay their respects to him, have you paid your respects to Venerable Sariputta yet? And they said no. He said, go see Sariputta. And so Sariputta told them, suppose someone asks you, what does your teacher teach? How would you explain? They said, we'd come for a long way to hear how you would explain. So Sariputta started out by saying, our teacher teaches the end of passion. They said, if those people are intelligent, then they'll ask, end of passion for what? The answer is end of passion for the aggregates. Why would he teach end the end of passion? Because when you have passion for the aggregates, form, feeling, perception, fabrications, and consciousness, then when those things change, you suffer. And if you have no passion for them, then they're going to change, but there'll be no suffering. So it's interesting. Sorry, Buddha didn't start with the Four Noble Truths. He didn't start with three characteristics. He started with the goal of the practice, which is dispassion. In Thai, they have a way of putting two words together. And then the word they tend to put together with Dhamma is atta, A-T-T-H-A, the goal, the meaning, the purpose. So we have the Dhamma, which are fabrications that the Buddha left behind, his verbal fabrications instructions for us on how to practice. But then he also made it very clear that what the atta of the Dharma was, was so that we could train our minds to find the true peace that comes with dispassion. Now, a lot of people don't like the idea of dispassion. Nowadays, if someone asked, what does the Buddha teach, and you said the end of passion, they probably wouldn't ask anything further. So we have to realize that dispassion is not a dead, lifeless state. It's a growing up. It's a sobering up. We've been intoxicated for who knows how long with the process of becoming. We like to take on identities in different worlds of experience. Because of what? Because of our passion. A desire becomes attractive. And then we take on an identity around that desire. We are the person who will benefit, benefit from fulfilling that desire, and they're also, we're also the person who can do something to bring it about. And there are all things we have to bring, do to bring it about, and the place where those desires can be met means that when we take on an identity, there's a world that goes with that. And we're fascinated with this, this kind of experience. We do it all the time in the mind. The thing is that when we do it in the mind, it doesn't stop there. It's not just an act of the imagination. It leads us to being reborn on all kinds of different levels. Think about the knowledges that the Buddha gained on the night of his awakening. The first was knowledge of the many, many lifetimes he had been through. When we sit down to meditate, sometimes we have narratives coming up from the day, narratives from the past. 
You can imagine what it would be like if you had aeons of narratives of all different kinds of levels of being, all different kinds of identities. That was the knowledge of the first night, first watch of the night. The second watch, the question was, was this true only of him? And there was also the question, of why was it that things would go up and down like that? Just looking at his own lifetimes was not enough to see the pattern. So he broadened his perspective. He saw that beings everywhere were going through the same process. It was basically came down to their actions. And the actions were determined by their views. And the views were determined by who they listened to, who they respected. If they respected people who did not believe in the principle of karma, did not believe that doing unskillful things would have problems, or doing skillful things would have benefits, then they were going to suffer. They go to low levels of being. They would become low levels of beings themselves, and then live in low, low worlds. If they listened to the noble ones, believed in the principle of karma, they would go to high levels, based on their actions that came from the views that they picked up from these other people. But even those high levels would fall. So the next question was, is there some way to train the mind so it doesn't have to continue in this up and down, up and down? And that was when he gained the third knowledge, was seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. seeing exactly what is suffering. So many people say the Buddha teaches everything is suffering or life is suffering. That's not what he said. He said clinging is suffering. And there's a cause for the clinging, craving, craving for sensuality, craving for becoming, and then paradoxically cra craving for non-becoming. In other words, when you've developed a particular becoming and then you want to see it destroyed, that's not the escape from becoming. That actually creates a new type of becoming. That presented a dilemma. Any becoming you create is going to involve passion and delight. That's the clinging. It's going to involve suffering. If you try to destroy it, well, that takes on another type of becoming. The solution the Buddha discovered was to see things, as he said, as they've come to be. In other words, the raw material from which we create these becomings, and to develop this passion for the raw material. That was going to be the way out. And he discovered it was possible to do that. And when you develop this passion for the craving, and dispassion for the objects of craving. That would be the cessation of suffering. And there's something you could do to get there. That was the fourth noble truth, which basically comes down to three main factors, virtue, concentration, discernment. So we practice virtue for the sake of dispassion. We practice concentration for the sake of dispassion discernment for the sake of dispassion. That's what turns these things into, from just simple activities that would lead to more becoming, to something that leads to beyond becoming. So what would that mean, virtue for the sake of dispassion? Well, to begin with, you do have to hold on to your precepts. And as you're holding on to the precepts, you will see the things that, the impulses in the mind that would pull you away to do something else that would break the precepts. And the only way you're going to hold to the precepts is to develop dispassion for the things that would pull you away. As the Buddha said, there could be wealth, even your health, even your relatives. Say so your relatives want you to lie for their sake or kill for their sake. You have to say no.
realizing that there may be some short-term benefit from breaking the precepts, but there's going to be a lot, lot of long-term pain. And your relatives can't be there to protect you from that long-term pain. So we practice the precepts to gain dispassion for the things that pull people back into into cycle of rebirth. And the same with concentration. You're sitting here and all kinds of thoughts will come up, thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of ill will, restlessness, anxiety, sleep, sleepiness, the desire to rest, uncertainty. You have to develop dispassion for these things. Otherwise, they pull you away. This is why we have the contemplation of the body act as a tool for dealing with sensual desire. Develop thoughts of goodwill, thoughts of equanimity to cut through ill will. Work with all the techniques for giving rise to energy when you're sleepy. And ways of talking to yourself when you find yourself restless and anxious or overcome with uncertainty. Realizing that no matter what is going to happen in the future, things are very uncertain. You can't plan. You can't nail down your plans. But you do know that when things come up in the future that are going to be unusual or, un or unthought of, if you have a lot of mindfulness and alertness, you'll be in a better position to deal with them. So you can develop those while you practice concentration. So you use concentration as a foundation for developing dispassion for these things. And the concentration not only makes you more clear-sighted, but also gives you a sense of well-being, something you can feed on, so you can stop feeding on other things, things that would pull you away. The same with discernment. And the Buddha is very clear about the fact that the aggregates do have their appeal. As he said, if they didn't have their appeal, people wouldn't fall for them. However, they also have their drawbacks. And so the dis acts of discernment focus on the drawbacks to help give rise to dispassion for all the things that would pull you back, pull you back. So we practice virtue, concentration discernment for the sake of dispassion. That's when we're using them right. We don't practice virtues to think that we're going to be better than other people. We don't practice concentration to gain power over other people. We don't practice discernment, develop discernment to show how smart we are. These things have their purpose, which is dispassion. And then, as the Johns have said again and again and again, they're like tools. Suppose that you're working on making a chair, making a table. As long as you're working on the project, you've got to hold on to your tools. When the project is done, you can put the tools down. In other words, you have to eventually let go of virtue, concentration, and discernment so that your dispassion can be total. As the Buddha points out, they too have their drawbacks. After all, they're built out of aggregates. They are inconstant. So you can't rest just with the factors of the path. You have to let them go. And that's when dispassion shows its real rewards. Dispassion goes on to total release. So that's the atta of the teaching. Now, this doesn't mean that after a person has gained awakening, they come back out and they don't have any virtue or concentration or discernment. They still have those qualities. As John Lee points out, you look at the Buddha's life. He still was a virtuous person. He still used his powers of concentration and his discernment in order to teach. But the relationship was different. As the Buddha said, once you've gained full awakening, you can still use these things, but you're disjoined from them. In other words, you don't have to feed on them anymore. There's nothing more that needs to be done for the sake of cleaning up the mind, 
finding purity, finding release. As long as you're still alive, there's work you can do. And it's good work. You can help other people find find the way to dispassion and release as well. It's at the end of the Arahant's life. That's when they put everything down. Like the Buddha on the night of his total nirvana. He'd been teaching for forty five years. Using all the good qualities he had developed prior to his awakening. Walking all over India, northern India, wherever there was someone he needed, who he knew was ready for, to receive the teaching, he would go. Even on the last day of his, his life, there was one more person he had to teach. So even though he was suffering dysentery that day, he walked many miles, finally lay down between these two trees near Gusinara, taught that one last person. And then he could let go totally. All the duties of the Buddha in finding the path and teaching the path were done. His work was complete. And he had entered nirvana, as I say, with no fuel remaining. The images of a of a fire that's going going out. On the night of his awakening, he became a fire that had stopped burning, but the coals were still warm. In other words, he still experienced pleasure and pain, but his mind was not affected by it. But there was still work to be done. On the night of his total nirvana, that's when the fire went totally out. And for a lot of us, the image seems to be kind of negative, but you have to remember back in India, their belief about fire was that while it was burning, it was agitated, clinging. When it went out, it was released. No more agitation, no more clinging. And it went out not because the fuel released it, it was because it released the fuel. That's how it became free. So that's the image we should keep in mind. The reason we're still stuck on these processes of becoming, weaving them again and again and again. It's not because of the becoming. We're the ones that are stuck. When John Lee's images of eating food, the food is not attached to us. If we don't eat the food in the morning, it's not going to cry. We're the ones that are upset when there's no food. In the same way we're attached to becoming. We're passionate about becoming. And it's for that reason that we're stuck. When we can develop dispassion, then we're freed. So this is what it means to practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. And this is what it means to practice, to pay homage to the Buddha through the practice. He didn't teach the Dharma so we could have nice monasteries and have a pleasant time in the monastery. He taught the Dharma so that we could find his passion, develop this passion, and then gain the rewards of that dispassion. That, he said, was the highest of all Dhammas, the Dharma for the sake of which every other Dharma is taught. So make that the for the sake of in your practice. You'll be paying homage to the Buddha in the way that's right. And it's only then that you'll understand the true meaning of the Dharma and how worthwhile the goal is. <laughs>